Father, this morning that you reminded me that you are above all, that you are above loneliness, you are above financial struggles, you are above hate, you are above racism, you are above prejudice, you are above cancer.
Thank you, Father. Lord, as we continue in this morning and just worshiping you, Father, we ask you to bless our efforts, Lord. We don't want to meet and do anything without your blessing, Lord. And, and as your kids, we just humble ourselves before you, knowing that you have your ears open to us. And one thing we ask this morning is for the Spirit to be released here today. Let us continue to reflect on the fact that He is above all. And for us that, you know, certain things come to mind that we are struggling with now that we need to be reminded of that God is above our struggles and God is above our pain, whether it's spiritual suffering, emotional, physical suffering. And Father, we just give it all to you. We give it all to you this morning. Because we know that your good grace is perfect, Father. That's all we need.
Thank you. 
Father, thank you for the faith that is rising in this room as we sing that song. And Lord, I lift up every person's prayer in this room um, that feels impossible, every desire that people have given up on because it was just too much and they didn't see an answer. And Father, thank you that you are the way maker. You're the God of miracles. You're the God who parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to walk through. And so Father, I pray for those who who have these impossible prayers and desires that they've given up on, Lord, that the faith, faith in this room would rise and they would, they would cling to those prayers again, that they would not lose hope, and that we would set our eyes on you, the miracle maker today. I pray that hope and faith and love would rise in this room right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a minute. Part of our worship is our offering. I want to read from Luke chapter 6, verse 37-38. It says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not con condemn others, and you will not be condemned. Actually, the verse is, or, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will be given. That's what I thought. I thought it should be, be given. But uh, my Bible says you will receive. And I thought, why does it say you will be given? Like, forgive, you'll be forgiven. Don't condemn, won't be condemned. Uh, what was the first one? Don't judge, you won't be judged. And I was praying about that, and it occurred to me that Receive is a bigger word than be given to. Like, be given to is like a, a specific thing. And receives just seems like so much bigger. You know, there's so many ways that we receive from God that sometimes we don't even realize it. That God has blessed me with a raise. God has uh, blessed me with good health. I've, I've received these things from God. God has... Uh, bless me with new friends. God has blessed me uh, with a community of believers. God has blessed me with a home group leader. God has blessed me with this worship music. I mean, we receive in so many ways, sometimes we don't even realize it. And Christmas is all about receiving, isn't it? God gave and we received our Lord and Savior. And of course, this ties into giving because there's a spiritual principle. You judge, and it sort of invites judging. You know, you condemn, and it somehow invites uh, condemnation, right? If you walk in unforgiveness, right, uh, somehow it sort of attracts unforgiveness. But when we give, somehow we're attracting God to give to us in big, broad ways that we might receive from Him. So we give out of a motivation of love, but the principle is we receive. And so I want you to be encouraged today. God's desire is that you would receive from Him. And that's what the Christmas story is all about. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the gift the gift of our Savior, a child born who would live a sinless life and die for us to buy us back. Not just that, but to adopt us and to fill us with your Spirit. So we are alive today in Christ Jesus because of his birth. And we receive today from you Because you have first given to us. And for that, Lord, we say thank you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Start those baskets around. You guys can handle moving it back and forth. While those are going, Yerji is going to introduce the communion. Yes, sir. 
let's just continue with what Kelsey studied and the worship plan was just amazingly working on. The pastors are as well preparing our hearts before we actually come to the Lord's table and celebrate what was done for us. And uh, the other day I was talking about what is actually, you know, uh, what does make any season special. But it is uh, the outward appearances, all the Christmas trees and all the stuff around it, you know, the nostalgical memories, or whether it is the assets, the reason for the season. And the answer is obvious. The reason for Christmas is because the church has put strategically the birth of Jesus to this darkest time in this northern hemisphere. And now we have the communion. What is the reason for communion? It's the essence of it. Lord Jesus has established communion for us as a gift. It's a means of grace to remember what it took for us to be reconciled with God, to, to be made alive in the Spirit. He has accomplished and finished His work on the cross. We are saved because Jesus has carried his sins for us. But at the same time, we are saved also by the Incarnation. It is because the eternal Son has become a baby boy. And he lived the whole life for us. From the cradle to the grave. As the second Adam. So that he can give us, give us the, his life. His life without any sin. And this is the great exchange we have on the cross. This is the greatest love of all. We have to just always remember it that, you know, we are made righteous. We are made holy. But it's Christ's righteousness. We are not better than other people outside walking in the darkness. We are forgiven. There's a big difference. And, uh, you know, um, this communion it needs to push us somewhere. It needs to push us to, because God loved us so much that He became one of us. We should be having the desire to, to walk outside and to tell those people about the truth. Even though they see it around themselves, they just blind it. You know, uh, I really like what one recent convert just has said. He said, you know, what are the people apart from Christ? They're walking dead and we need to bring them to their life. We are connected with Christ through His blood, through the sacrifice. And this is the only thing which we need to remember. This is the essence of the communion, the broken body and the shed blood. Let's remember that. And uh, I would like to invite the servers. People have two stations. Why here and just outside? And just look at the cup. Look at the cup and remember two things. We are now living in the second advent. We are waiting for Jesus to come back. We, by, by taking this bread and drinking this blood, we proclaim Christ's death until He comes. And also look at the cup, look at the bread, and remember what Jesus says. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the blood, though he dies, will live. So let's go Jesus' bread. Heavenly, gracious, loving Father, you have made possible possible. We just so much thank you that you have come to this world and that you have called us and that we have received your calling and received the gift of salvation, which is you, Jesus, which is to be in you, which is to be united in the Spirit and walk not accordingly to our dead selves, but according to the, to the Spirit. So, Lord God, let us just be what we are. Fear less warriors for you. Let us be those who are able to make a difference. Let us step into the into the in this world which is fallen and is full of injustice. And let us be a difference. Let us shine in Jesus' name.
I'm going to thank you for your favor. Thank you for your son. Thank you, Father, that we know um, that we're, we're not children who have a father that we need to win the approval of because Christ already won your approval. And um, we know that we had that need. And you are so great and so wonderful and so full of grace. And you found a way to fulfill that need to, to break separation to bring us back together and through Christ's birth and coming into this world. Father, this season that we celebrate that, Father, and we are just so grateful. So let us reflect on that. Uh, let us not just, you know, let the season be the season to go through emotions. Um, let us just realize what this person, this character that we know very deeply, God, our King and sending his only son. There's somebody that cares for us very deeply, made this decision for you, for me. So it's someone who just loves us and knows, knows us more intimately than anyone ever could. Father, you found us worth it. And we're just so grateful, Father. Just pray that you bless this one. We love you and we praise you. In your name, Amen. Christmas is mentioned by the first man in history. You mean Adam? Sure. 
On December 24th, he said, It's Christmas, Eve. <laughs> I do like the presents at Christmas, though. Me too, Hunter. What did you give your little brother for Christmas last year? I gave him the measles. <laughs> You're impossible. Good night. Ready to listen to some Christmas carols? Sure. I hear the kids have something really special. I don't think you
Titan. Ready? The Virgin Mary was here with child in me. Sing it.
What if I told you that there are promises from God that you don't want? Okay? So let me... There we go. Okay. So here's a promise that I don't think that you want. Um, God opposes the proud. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever attempted to do something? Uh, you thought it was a great idea, but you had this feeling in your heart that it wasn't necessary necessarily God's idea, it was just yours. Maybe even that you were just operating in the flesh and hoping he would come along and bless you in it. And have you ever had the experience that when you did that, God seemed to be stopping you at every turn? Anybody here have that experience? Show of hands, okay. Um, I think pretty much everyone. I certainly have, but I've done it more times than I'd like to count. Here's a promise from God that you do want. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Um, do you remember a time when you made a decision, even if it was against your flesh, even if it was against your desire, but you knew that it was God's will, and you went ahead and did it? Maybe you you moved to some place, maybe even Prague, and that was definitely not your original intention. Maybe you took a job you didn't want to take. Maybe you took on a ministry in the church you didn't want to take on that ministry. But you felt like, this is God's will for my life. And the result was, God blessed you at every turn. He seemed to open every door. He seemed to hear that voice well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful place to be? Well, he promises that he will show favor to the humble. So today's topic, choosing humility over pride. And those of you who know me understand why I felt like this was chosen specifically for me. Um, so let's look at this quality, humility, that God shows favor to. And I'm just going to, you know, I want you to know that I was blown away when I did research for this on how much there is in the Bible about being humble and how much that means to God. So I just chose about eight or nine of the different kind of actions or characteristics uh, in humility, biblically speaking. If you want, you can take a picture of the screen. You'll have the references. You can look, at the, look them up later. Humility equals... This is Christmas time. Jesus, from the manger to the cross. Humility is a sign of true religion. You ever seen somebody who loves Jesus, is humble, never seeks the credit, and you just have a sense that this person understands what true Christianity is all about? Humility is necessary to enter God's kingdom. You definitely can't go before God and say, I want to enter your kingdom but please appreciate all the amazing and wonderful things about me. Okay. Humility is necessary to be great. Maybe this would be a good lesson for some of the leaders we have in the world. Um, also for some of the sports stars. <laughs> also for some of the celebrities. And on and on. Um, humility is the absence of self. That one. Really tough. Humility may involve praying and fasting. I would even say that if you want to experience true humility, it's not a may, it's a definite. Prayer and fasting. Humility comes from the heart. It's not something that you can design or create, it comes out of a humble heart. Humility is the gateway to deliverance. So if you're struggling with something, like we have struggles in our family life, we have struggles with our kids, with certain things they're dealing with, with me as well. And I know that to be delivered, for God to answer the prayer for my deliverance, I need to be humbled and broken by Him. Humility leads to wisdom. So we pursue humility. But we never really perfectly achieve it. Actually, if you think that you've perfectly achieved humility, you've lost it. Ephesians 4.2, be completely 
humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now, on the flip side, I'll just speak briefly about pride. We could obviously do uh, a month or six months of messages on humility and pride and how it destroys, how it's dangerous. Uh, it's natural. It's, you don't have to ask God to give you the gift of pride. You got it, okay? It's often hidden from ourselves and obvious to everyone else. It's the source of hasty and critical judgment. Uh, pride demands recognition from others. Pride divides, but humility opens the door to union. And I'll give you an example from my own life. I am a selfish and prideful person, and I like to get attention, and I want my own way. I was married to Honor for years, and we didn't have any kids. I had no competition. I had lots of attention from her. Along come three boys, and suddenly they are almost the sole focus of attention in our family. This made me very irritated. Now, um, the boys are seven, six, and five. I'm uh, and about, uh, <laughs> about once, once a week, I get tired of my kids getting all of the attention. So I get angry. And I call my wife into the office where I work at home. And I'm angry and I speak angrily to her. And she does the most infuriating thing. She does nothing. <laughs> she listens. She's quiet. I really hate. She's humble, she quietly walks out of the room, and that just makes it worse. If she would just scream at me and yell at something, you know, then I could feel like she hurt me, and I have reason to be angry. My rights. But she doesn't do that. And I hear this voice in my head, and I think that it's God speaking, and he says, You just hurt your wife. Your pride hurt the woman that I gave you to cherish. You need to go to her and admit that you're wrong, and you need to apologize. And if your kids heard you speaking to her in that way, you need to tell them that you were wrong. Otherwise, they might grow up thinking that's the way that a godly man speaks to his wife. So, of course, I swallow my pride. I ask her to forgive me. But you know what? As a result of that, we end up being closer. So maybe this is a good strategy for our marriage to be better. Um, okay, go on. Here we go. But God shows the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God shows the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God shows the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. I was at a Christian conference and I heard a Chinese Christian speaking, and he had spent years uh, in a Chinese concentration camp. I called that liberally because it was a place of torture, of death, just because of what people believe. And he told the story, he had es he'd escaped. After he got out of the prison, they let him out, I don't know, 20 years, whatever, he escaped China, and he made his way to America. And he said the one character that he remembered more than any other in that prison was an old man, a pastor, and every day that old man was given one job to do. His job was to grab a wheelbarrow with a shovel and to go down into a pit that was filled with human excrement. His job was to shovel and fill the wheelbarrow, then to roll it out of the pit, go over to a pit next to that one, go down into the pit, and dump the wheelbarrow. Then he had to fill the wheelbarrow again with feces, stinking, wretched human excrement, turn around, go back up, go over to the other pit, and down and do the same thing. And he had to do it 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And we're listening to this and we're thinking, well, that's not very inspiring. That's like one of the worst things I could ever imagine. And he said, this is what the old man would do 
when he would go down in the pit. The guards didn't want to be near the pit. But he would go down in the pit and he would start singing praise songs. He would sing and he would sing and he would sing. And one by one, guards in that prison would give their life to Jesus. They would give their life to Jesus. He said, that old man, in his time there, to the day I left, was the greatest evangelist that the prison ever had. Total humility. The focus was on lifting up and exalting Jesus Christ. He believed the promise that if Jesus is lifted up, he will draw men to himself. That was an amazing and inspiring uh, thing for me to hear. I couldn't compare it with anything in my life. But now it brings me to Christmas and the greatest act of humility that the world has ever or will ever see. There's no place in the inn for, G for Joseph and Mary. No place for the Son of God to be married, or excuse me, the Son of God to be born, except in a stable. In a manger, surrounded by farm animals, shepherds, foreigners, God's way. The way of humility and the antithesis of pride. I want to share with you now my favorite passage in the entire Bible. I have a lot of them, but this one struck me more the first time I read it uh, when I was 21 years old, a long time ago, and it stuck with me ever since. It's really, in one passage, the humble story of Jesus from birth to resurrection. Philippians 2, verses 3 through 7. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And I'll go on in a moment. There's another part to this passage that finishes the great story. But isn't that what Christmas is all about? Isn't it about the most amazing human being who ever lived, the very Son of God, as the character in the drama said, someone you could say, who had the power to just wipe them all out. And yet he couldn't go against his nature. His nature was to humble himself, be rejected, be tortured, be nailed to a cross, to be raised on the third day, resurrection to appear to many, to prove to them that love, the love of God, conquers all. And you know what? He knew you when he did. He thought about you when he did. He completed his work so that you could be saved and spend eternity with the Lord to know his blessing here on earth. He did that for you. <laughs> and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's my favorite passage. From a manger to an ascension, patiently waiting for the day, we will see Him again in all of His glory. The question is, 
Will you see him in all of his glory? Have you accepted and received the King of Kings fully? Is there something holding you back which causes you to be stopped at every turn by a Lord who just wants a broken follower who will follow Jesus and acknowledge him as Savior and Lord? And this is the question we all have to deal with. And when we resolve that issue, there is an amazing peace that surpasses all understanding that can come. I became a Christian at 21, now I'm 65. I've made a tremendous amount of mistakes, made a lot of bad decisions, dealt with my addictions, and yet through it all, I never questioned the fact that Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Let's pray. I'm so, so thankful for that day when you came into my life and received me when I was baptized and rose up in the resurrection and experienced the grace which could only come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And for each one here, Lord, we pray right now that we can remember that moment, whether that moment be the last year, 10 years ago, 40 years ago, or whether it be today, the moment when grace comes flooding into our hearts and our souls. It's a renewal that can happen daily, and you want it to happen in all of us right now. We want to be flooded with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I pray in His name. Amen. So we are, we are coming to the point of our service. We have a Christmas, uh, Christmas cookie, of the Sunday, you can do and have fellowship. But you can raise that uh, to see the benediction of it. I'm reading in the scripture from Romans, chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them who came to Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So, um, Father, we pray to our lives for this week, Lord, that we shall think of us, the way you think of us, Lord. We shall have your mindset, Lord. We shall not be faithful. We call others the God as we live, who walk the God in the Spirit, and according to the Spirit, and according to the Spirit. May your name be glorified in the God in everything that we do. In Jesus' blessing we pray. Amen. Amen. So you are dismissed, uh, but this is also time for ministry. So if you have a prayer need, I'd like to invite uh, first home group leaders and ministry team to come forward. We want some people ready to pray for those who want prayer. If you don't want prayer, you're welcome to go and start grabbing the, uh, the tea, the coffee, the cookies on the tables. Just pull the cover off the cookies. There's another box of coffee that's on the way. So if that box is empty, there will be more. And I want to remind you, next Sunday there's a concert here that's already sold out. So no service next Sunday. Uh, we will be having a reception for those people who don't get the message. Uh, up in the trick bar, we'll be just doing some Christmas videos and having more Christmas cookies and coffee and stuff. So, um, Merry Christmas to all of you, and I hope you can stick around and uh, fellowship. That's what we plan to do today, was just hang out and enjoy whatever's coming. <laughs>